been up here to introduce our speaker. As, uh, Wendell Stevens is involved also. But uh, Jim uh, Nichols, who will be speaking for us November 10th about the Pleiadians, and he's, he'll be talking about his book that he just wrote. He'll be here. So, Jim, if you'll come up here and talk to the people and do your introductions. So, at this time, I'm going to turn this over to Jim Sherrod to introduce our speaker because she's got some things she's going to read here. So, Jim, here you are. Thank you, George. Wendell Stevens is in Japan speaking at three different cities, Osaka, Sapporo, and Tokyo. And he gave me the things that he'd be speaking on, but I'm not going to take time to read them because there are too many of them. There's about six or seven of each subject that he's going to cover in each city. And Susie, his wife, was able to go with him. Michael Sala of Exo Politics Institute in Hawaii is also going to be on the tour. We'll be back in 30. Beings he had known, Michael Schrapp, for some time, he said he would write this up for me. I met Michael Schrapp years ago when he came to our Laughlin Congress in 2003 with a notebook holding six of the best and clearest photographs of flying discs I had seen since the Meyer, the Billy Meyer photos in Switzerland. Naturally, I had to know where he had gotten them. He said that he had taken them himself with his own digital camera at government test sites. He said he had been trying for some time to break into the Black Project files and that in time he had succeeded and discovered some codes that gave him access to such information. He went to the test sites he found to see what he could see and in fact did see and photograph some of those projects under test. He said that he believed that they were advanced Hanabu craft, which I knew referred back to the Nazi German V7 weapons development program that I have been researching for years. What became my curiosity most was the fact that he had copied drawings of some of the old Nazi discs that I had not seen before. I knew that we had captured some 22 of the German discs and brought them to the White Sands <coughs> Missile Test Range for study. I had the records of the Hanabu disc that broke block on a controlled test and crashed eight miles south of Laredo. Laredo, Texas, and that the pilot photographed in that wreckage was a large species rhesus monkey named emu that was among 16 such trained monkeys to be used in testing biological effects of Hanabu flight crews. I initiated correspondence with Michael and he sent me more of those photographs, including some even in series that he said he had taken which are all published in my ebook, Nazi Discs, the German V-7 weapons development programs available from UFO photo archives, 300 pages for $25. Our Jim Nichols had also written a book on the Nazi UFOs, and so I introduced Jim to Michael as well. I am anxious to hear more of how Michael managed to get such photographs but I will be in Japan on a three-city tour while Michael is here. I will get a copy of his presentation from Jim Rogers and an interview by Rick Keith. Good luck, Michael, in your future research of this nature. Please keep us informed, Wendell. Now, Rick Keith is now filming the, the program instead of Jim Rogers. Jim had a program last night, as George told you. So 
I think without any ado, let's welcome Michael Schrapp. Good afternoon. I'm certainly excited to be here today. I want to thank June, Jim Nichols, and George for giving me the opportunity to join all of you fine folks uh, this afternoon. My background includes uh, aerospace CAD drafting within the aerospace industry. We do a lot of uh, in-flight entertainment, STC work for foreign and domestic airlines. And what I'd like to do for you this afternoon is give you a brief overview of some of the classified aircraft programs very deep within the military industrial complex. And we're actually going to break this down into three distinct categories. Category number one is what we've termed a black program. That's any program that has less than 5% congressional oversight. The second category is what we've termed a deep black program. And the third and final category is what's called a USAP or unacknowledged special access program. If you work in one of these projects and the president asks you for specific details regarding that program, your mandatory reply is to be, Mr. President, no such project exists. Mm -hmm. So it's appropriate that we begin with this particular aircraft right here. This is the Boeing Phantom Works Bird of Prey, declassified October 2002 under the current Bush administration. Now this particular aircraft was the first aircraft to use single piece composite aircraft construction in conjunction with 3D virtuality design components. $67 million was the procurement funding for, for this particular aircraft. And if you'd like to see this aircraft, it's currently hanging above an aircraft called Tacit Blue at the Air Force Museum, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. 47 feet in length, 23 foot wingspan, 67 test flights were made between 1992 and 1999. And you'll notice here, there's very few seams in this aircraft whatsoever. No metal fasteners are used at all in this particular aircraft. And you'll notice the smooth contouring of the entire component, everything is blended in, unlike the F-117 that was declassified November 10th, 1988. So that's the Boeing Phantom Works Bird of Prey. In this location, you have the air intake. The exhaust port is located at the aft end of the aircraft. Only one was actually built. So this is strictly a one-off prototype design. Here you can see some of the seams for the control surfaces and then the starboard aileron in this location. And that's all you're going to see for seams in this particular aircraft. There are no skin seams whatsoever as you would see on a conventional aircraft design. A good shot of the aft end of the bird of prey, and then the landing gear doors here, which would retract up, hiding most of the radar cross section in that location. Good shot of the pilot, single pilot design. And again, if anyone wants to see this aircraft, it's currently at the Air Force Museum, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio. Now we're moving on to the Aviation Week Space Technology article on the Lockheed Skunk Works Polecat, a single one-off prototype unmanned aerial vehicle. $29 million was spent on this particular program. And by May of 2004, it was ready for its first flight. Unfortunately, this particular aircraft crashed uh, not too far from the remote test site Levada, no longer exists. And so that's basically the bottom word on Polcat. Detroit Free Press, speaking about the secret ledger, hides military projects. Pentagon black budget has tripled under the Reagan administration. So we're asking the question, how have these programs been funded and how have they been able to keep these secrets? The Defense Department's secret accounts. Growth of the secret defense research and development in billions of dollars. And if you look at the far left hand of this screen, you'll see that in 1981, the procurement was just over a half a billion dollars spent on black programs. By 1988, the number rose to $9.122 billion, a tremendous increase. Over here, we have federal spending by category in billions of dollars for fiscal year 1988. We spent $25 billion on education. We spent uh, $26 billion on agriculture. Transportation was $28 billion. But 
the Pentagon's black budget was $35 billion. So we're spending more on classified black budget programs than we actually are on education. So I'm asking the question, do we have our priorities set straight within the government here? And then just as the breakdown shows here, Air Force black budget for 1988, the total was $51.1 billion. Of that, $19 billion was the actual Air Force black budget program. So that's a breakdown of what these costs are really all about. In search of the Pentagon's billion dollar hidden budgets, how the U.S. keeps its R&D spending under, under wraps? And that's really the question. How do they hide these programs from the public? I would certainly recommend that everyone here today obtain a copy of this particular document. It's called the RDT&E Programs R1. It stands for Research, Development, Test, and Evaluations R1. And in this document, approximately 24 pages in length, it gives you the breakdown of a number of different programs, including electronic countermeasures, uh, troop transport movements, F-16 operations. And then as you further go through this document, many of these programs start falling off the radar screen, as you see here. Programs called Seek Bandit. It's a classified aircraft program. We don't know what it is. Seek Orange, classified aircraft program. Senior J, U.S. Air Force Special Access Program. We don't even know what these programs are. And over here we have Have Flag, Senior Year, and Forest Green. So not only do we not know what these programs are, we don't know how much was spent. So the bottom line being, you take the total amount from the knowns, and what you're left with are the unknowns, and that is the black budget. A-12 Avenger II was designed to be an all-weather attack aircraft to replace the A-6 intruder. By 1990, Dick Cheney had a procurement of 650 of these aircraft, but one year later, in 1991, the whole program was scrapped. Five billion dollars in tax dollars was spent on this program, and we have absolutely nothing to show for this program. So, I'm asking the question, we really should have just been received a refund check for this program. We would have been better off writing all of us a refund check because now we have nothing to show for this program. Again, we have the A-12 Avenger II that was a joint McDonnell Douglas General Dynamics program, a tandem two-seat design, carrier-based operation. Here is the air intake on both sides of the pilot's compartment just aft of the forward crew section. Good shot of the A-12 in-flight would have been a very low radar cross-section aircraft if indeed it did go into production. The only known illustration that you're ever going to see within the public domain which highlights the Lockheed ATB Advanced Technology Bomber Stealth Program. This was Lockheed's version. Of course, Northrop won the project, but Lockheed's version was an overgrown F-117 with a long tail boom and an inverted forward swept tail arrangement. This is the one-fifth scale mock-up here. And you can see some of the faceted flat plate technology also used on the F-117. So here we see the strategic long-range bomber. Wingspan was 152. And then again, you can see the faceted flat plate technology. So that was the Lockheed Senior Peg. This graphic here illustrates the mismanagement of funds uh, within the military industrial complex. <laughs> I just love the leopard skin instrument panel and the solid gold bomb site. And over here you see our daycare centers and our schools dilapidated and derelict, falling apart. And uh, the funding is completely wrong for these type programs. Tacit Blue was the first quad redundant fly-by-wire flight control system that used a side scanning radar. Only one was ever built. It is also at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, so you can see it there. The aft end had two canted vertical stabilizers that were canted outward from the center line of the aircraft. Here you also see the exhaust port of Tacit Blue. And then this is the only known photograph showing the interior components and analog gauges of the cockpit section of Tacit Blue. An interesting French art type piece that shows the smooth contouring somewhat similar to what we see in the B-2 stealth bomber. And then originally, prior to 88, during the rollout of the B-2, 
we actually didn't know what the configuration was. Many thought that it was a single straight trailing edge that you see in this illustration with four jet engines, which was correct. And then Rebel Corporation had a sort of a smooth contouring leading edge with a curvature and then a straight trailing edge. There is some evidence to indicate that at least two subscale flying prototypes of this particular aircraft actually did make it to the flying prototype stage. This is an interesting 90% scale sheet metal mock-up that was built for the Honda CRX SI release back in 1988, part of an advertising campaign. Uh, approximately 150 feet across, it weighed 200,000 pounds, the whole thing be built out of sheet metal. And when this particular commercial was aired on television, the phones at the Pentagon blew up because they had just about nailed the co correct configuration of the B-2. The wing sweep angle is a bit too steep, and you'll notice over here, the cord of the wing is too thick, but generally speaking, without any inside information, Honda did a fairly successful job at recreating what the B-2 actually looked like before it was rolled out to the public. Now this is the actual B-2 here. Interesting to keep in mind that the cost of the B-2 bomber is $2.3 billion per aircraft. That's more than its own weight in gold, and so that's where our tax dollars are going. 172 foot wingspan, and you'll notice here the double W or sawtooth trailing edge, and that's gonna become important as we move along here. Again, you can see the front view here with the two air intakes and very smooth contouring design, unlike the faceted flat plates that we see on the F-117. Project Senior CJ from Washington Post spoke about unraveling stealth black world Questions of cost and mission arise amid debate over secrecy. So even they're questioning this debate over secrecy. Now, some of the internal weapons that the B-2 carries. We know that it has conventional and nuclear armaments. We also know the B-2 carries what's called a dial yield. So they can take some of these nuclear weapons and go from 1 megaton all, all the way up to 10 megatons in yield. The only known illustration that you're going to see of the interior components of the B-2. As far as I'm concerned, no unclassified photograph has ever been showed which displays the engine access panels of the B-2 being removed. This is about the closest that we're ever going to get to see what is actually going on inside the B-2. Now, by 1983, Northrop spent $22.4 billion on research and development for the B-2 program and had nothing to show for it. A year later, in 1984, the U.S. Air Force changed its mind. They decided they no longer wanted a high altitude bombing platform, but wanted a low altitude bombing platform. Now that cost all of us $1 billion for the wing redesign. Here you see the single sawtooth trailing edge back in 1983, and then one year later, it got changed to the double W sawtooth trailing edge. Again, that was a $1 billion bill for all of us. And just to illustrate one more time, the single sawtooth moving on to the double W sawtooth trailing edge. Again, an interesting report from New York Times, which had the same type wing redesign. Now, we move on to an Aviation Week Space Technology report from March 9th, 1992 which talked about a number of classified programs and details which are actually being used within the B-2 bomber. One of them being that the B-2 electrically charges the leading edge of the wing to reduce the radar cross-section and then electrically charges the exhaust gases to reduce the infrared signature. Now, what happens when you do this, according to a 1968 report from Northrop, is there is a re resulting drag coefficient reduction up to 60 percent. And these engineers were very upset that this kind of technology was not being filtered down to the civilian airline industry, which would help all of us. This could in turn reduce the fuel consumption on airliners by 60 percent, just a tremendous increase in, in efficiency. But what also happens here is when you electrically charge the leading edge of the wing and then ionize negatively the exhaust gases, you set up what's called a gravity wave, where there's a gravity well in front of the aircraft and a gravity hill in the back of the aircraft, essentially 
turning this thing into an over unity device where you can shut down the engines and this thing will run on its own. So very interesting. Avro, which is now British Aerospace, had their own design for electroprovetic propulsion aircraft. And then we have the similar early B2 concept design, and then following up with the final design of the B2 on the bottom here. Now this is the patent, that's number 4,989006. One of the technologies used on the B2 is a radar absorbent technology. This is the patent that actually shows how this is done, embedded inside the leading edge of the B2. Now, if you can't spend billions that Northrop has done, there's another way to do this. One way to make a conventional aircraft stealthy is to ionize the entire aircraft with a plasma stealth in front of the aircraft, and that's what's being shown in this patent right here by Boyd Bushman. He's a retired Lockheed Skunkworks engineer who came up with this particular design. Now this is the cost analysis of the B-2 procurement funding. Now we mentioned by 83, they spent a grand total of $22.4 billion on the B-2 program. And so we'll quickly break through some of these different costs here. We're going to give Northrop $35 million for the development of stealth technology. We're just going to give that to them off the bat. We're going to give them $65 million for their Pico Rivera plant where not a, many of the components were put together. To build Tacit Blue, which we already showed, we're going to give them $1 billion for that. $100,000 salary for 4,000 people, that's $400 million. To purchase computers, we're going to give them $2 billion for that. And then to purchase equipment, we'll throw in $2 billion for that. That gives us a grand total of $5.5 billion. We subtract that amount from the $22.4 billion that was spent, and we're left with a remaining $16.9 billion that disappeared into thin air. Absolutely no funding, no accounting for this missing $16.9 billion. We have no idea where this money went. It's just an absolute tragedy. I'm proposing that some of that funding was filtered off into a different, more advanced version of the B2 something that over 25,000 eyewitnesses in the Hudson Valley area saw and witnessed between 1982 and 1988. Thousands of people pulled off to the side of the road, saw this gigantic boomerang flying wing shaped device that had a same type version of the B-2 but the single sawtooth trailing edge identical to the original design of the B-2 prior to the wing redesign. Now, if you doubt me on some of these electrobravitic propulsion technologies, I invite you to pick up a copy of this book. It's called Electrobravitic Systems by Thomas Malone. Reports on a new propulsion methodology specifically goes into details of how this system works on the B-2. Leslie Kulba from Electric Spacecraft Journal wrote a really good review here, and she says an underlying theme is that T.T. Brown propulsion, once developed, will usher in an age of flight so revolutionary it will make all previous aviation from the Wright brothers to space shuttles constitute the stone age of flight. That's exactly what we're talking about here. DARPA program called the QSP, that stands for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. The QSP was the Quiet Supersonic Platform. This was a government program to determine how we can reduce our sonic footprint and get rid of the sonic boom from military and civilian applications by extending the nose of the aircraft, having it blend into, into a supercritical wing, thereby reducing some of the shock waves. Interesting report from Poplar Science that spoke specifically about electrochromic panels and how that they're taking what's behind the aircraft and electrically projecting that image onto the forward top surface of the aircraft, essentially making it blend into the background and causing it to become practically invisible. Already in the field now, can be retrofitted for troop transport, army personnel, tanks. It's already a done deal, already being used now. Sneaky Pete, another version that led to something called Model 100, was designed in 1984. It was designed and built by a company called Task Engineering in California. Test pilots were Dick Rutan and Mike Melville and looked very similar to a long easy that you would see at a local air show. Lockheed Skunk Works Project Q or Quartz was a design to be 
a single pilot reconnaissance high altitude platform. Unfortunately, only two subscale models were ever built. Both of these crashed, and that was the final analysis for Project Q, which had a wingspan of 185 feet and two retractable outrigger wheels at the extreme tips of the aircraft. A 1973 design report called CL-1980 from Lockheed Skunk Works. Ben Rich was the senior project design engineer on this particular program. You can see the engine nacelles, very similar to the SR-71. And then again, you can see the forward shine section, almost similar to the SR-71 here. But instead of having twin vertical stabilizers that we see on the SR, this particular aircraft only had a single vertical stabilizer. However, that aircraft was never built. Moving on to the Project Fish from General Dynamics Convair. This aircraft was designed to fly at Mach 4, 90,000 feet altitude. This would have been the competitor, actually it was the competitor to the A-12 by Lockheed. Of course, Convair lost the contract, would have been the actual winner though. A 67 degree swept delta wing configuration using two ramjet engines. A very high speed aircraft that was designed to be airdrop from a B-58 Hustler. Now, the acronym FISH stands for First Invisible Super Hustler. And you can see here the two ramjet engines at the aft end of the craft. Also here, the nice 67 degree blended swept wing configuration. Now, if there was any type of malfunction with the smaller engines that could be jettisoned out the side of these panels of the aircraft here, the pilot would be left to land at a very high angle of attack at about 170 to 180 knots. So you'd have to be a really good pilot to land this. And then also you see here the fish being loaded onto the belly lower section of the B-58 Hustler. Moving on to the Boeing Joint Strike Fighter. They lost the contract to the current JSF by Lockheed. Some might say that it was a political dis decision why Lockheed won might have been the same reason why they won the F-22. So that's the JSF from Boeing. Now we have the Lintemco Vought Atom II that stands for Air Deflection and Modulation. This was a design proposal to take advantage of something called the Coanda effect, where they would take bleed off thrust from the engine and direct it right over the top surface of the wing, causing a low pressure zone, allowing this thing to take off <coughs> vertically. And then that's Adam II. You can see it was a twin tandem pilot type design. Air intakes on both sides of the pilot's compartment. A 1959 report from Boeing, now declassified, was confidential at one time. But here they highlighted a number of very interesting wind tunnel test miles that had this similar blended 75 degree swept wing configuration that we've already shown before. Here you see two vertical stabilizers and the same supercritical 75 degree triangular swept wing configuration and that's certainly going to become important too. Boeing Soft Crab, the only known illustration that I've ever been able to find on this particular aircraft, it was a stealthy troop insertion aircraft. Anywhere between 24 and 36 troops can be used in this particular design that had a vertical takeoff capability. Up here you see the Humvee being loaded into the aft end of this craft. And then I always like to point out that in this document, it says range and wind tunnel tested. So at the very least, something called Softocrat was either built, flown, or test model. Wind tunnel test model was actually built of this particular aircraft. Vintage 1960s report from Lockheed on an infantry in-ground effect aircraft that could actually take an entire infantry division on a combat run. You'll see the cutaway here of helicopters, armored personnel, small tanks, troop transport, they have different aircraft, all embedded in this entire ship. So would have been a logistical nightmare to do the structural analysis, but again, it was an actual paper designed by Lockheed. 1976 report from McDonnell Douglas, specifically talking about gigantic lenticular disc-shaped craft, diamond-shaped craft that are lighter than air vehicles between six and eight hundred feet in diameter, gigantic cargo lifter, so just making the point that the next time you go out at night and you see this gigantic 
800 foot diameter ship that's floating silently over your head, just remember it might be one of ours via this 1976 McDonnell Douglas report. Sky Ship Project talking about a heavy lifter construction lighter than air vehicle with a 400 ton capability, the same type almost conventional dirigible design, just illustrating that the whole concept of airships being phased out is completely false. It's at the cutting edge today. Now these aircraft have been seen in Belgium in the early 90s, also in southern Illinois in the late 1990s, have been sighted all over the world, completely silent. This article asked the question, lighter than air vehicles, are they on the rise? Uh, they're absolutely, definitely on the rise, and you can see just a sense of scale here. We've got a little ship down here, and then this entire deltoid blimp is dwarfing this ship at the bottom, so just to give you a size of scale on this particular aircraft. Now this is an accurate illustration of what was seen by over 25,000 eyewitnesses in the Hudson Valley area. Reported a boomerang flying wing type configuration with a single sawtooth trailing edge. There was a series of light patterns on the port and starboard under surface of the aircraft and one large light in the bottom center part of the aircraft. Now the official government explanation, official government explanation on this is that this was nothing more than a group of crackpot ultralight pilots flying at night in formation. That was the explanation. That is what they said it was. So, you know, here we have an ultralight pilot here, and of course this would be at night, and you'd be flying no more than 20 feet from the other guy, so that's very dangerous. But they forgot to mention that Practically all ultralights are powered by a two-cycle Rotex 447 engine that you can hear between three and five nautical miles away. So it's not consistent with what the eyewitnesses reported hearing and seeing. So we can throw that particular explanation out the window. Lenticular re-entry vehicle by North American Aviation, a 1960s proposal for their atomic bombing platform, a rapid response bombing platform. The F-108 Rapier was a complementary design, something that was to fly as a wingman to the North American Aviation XB-70. A full-scale half part of the mock-up was actually built and never actually went into production. So that's the F-108 Rapier. A report here, patent number 5,984231, speaking about a forward swept wing Northrop Mach 3 interceptor aircraft that would be carrier based. So there's some good evidence to indicate that we have something in the inventory that looks like this in the field at this time. Moving on to the top secret TR-3A Black Manta, also known as the Manta Ray. Top secret reshaping the look of America's air power. This is from Poplar Mechanics. This particular aircraft was used in conjunction with F-117s during Desert Storm in 1991. It was used as a digital real-time reconnaissance intelligence gathering aircraft. Had a crew of one. It was a General Dynamics McDonnell Douglas program. Teledyne Ryan was retained as a subcontractor. There was an air intake on both sides of the pilot's compartment. Two vertical stabilizers that were canted inward toward the center line of the aircraft. And also it's important to note that this particular aircraft was able to operate from carriers. And I did receive a very reliable report from a KC-135 boom operator who in 1991 was refueling three particular aircraft. Two of these were F-117s that took on fuel from the KC-135 boom. When these two F-117s broke away, this particular aircraft came up, he took on fuel, and he broke away. So we have his report to go along with a number of other eyewitnesses. Also, it's interesting to note that for every three F-117s, there is one TR-3A. Now, we know there's 59 F-117s built, so that equates to approximately 19 TR-3As currently in the inventory now. Here is the Teledyne Ryan patent, and you can see some of the pattern recognition here. It's the same air intake configuration, the same canted vertical stabilizers, and then the pilot's compartment is located up center in the front. This is the only known article ever printed about something that took place in September of 1994. 
This is the RAF Boscom down crash of a top secret stealth aircraft. It was an American aircraft. All we know is that it suffered some type of malfunction. It might have been the landing gear failed. There was a crew of two. It looked very similar to the YF-23, which is a Northrop product. It had two inward canted vertical stabilizers. The craft was towed back and put inside a hangar, and a tarp was put over the midsection of the aircraft, exposing the nose and the tail section of the aircraft, so that could be seen by eyewitnesses. The next night, a C-5, which is shown over here, was flown in, it was loaded into the C-5, and then everything was shipped back to Air Force Plant 42 Palmdale, and that's the last we ever heard of it. Nothing has ever been said more about this particular aircraft. It might have looked similar to this, a Northrop design called the Astra, with a 75 degree swept wing configuration and two inward canted vertical stabilizers. Popular science talked about America's $1 billion high flying 4,400 mile an hour ramjet. Reports started coming out in the press in the late 1980s that we were phasing out the SR-71. One reason was costs involved in keeping that program alive and also the idea that we had satellites that could do the job better than a manned reconnaissance aircraft. But that's not consistent with thousands of eyewitness reports of a XB-70-like mothership that's been sighted all over Lancaster, Palmdale area. Two eyewitness reports of landing at Edwards Air Force Base. It had a very interesting blended forward chine configuration. Also two retractable canards for low speed operation. And then the chine would taper back to a modified delta wing with 16 foot high winglets at the wing tips. And in Burbank, from this 1992 report, we see something being loaded into the forward section of a C-5. That's what eyewitnesses reported seeing. Some type of very unusual design being loaded into the forward section of the C-5. And that gives you an idea of what actually took place. This is an A-12 being loaded into the C-5 here. You see how long this thing was. So what was being loaded was chopped at about right here, and the rest of it was folded and put away. Now if you took what we have here, the A-12, which first flew in 1962 by Robert Gilliland at the remote test site in Nevada, if you took these engine nacelles and you turned them into box-like structures, put them on the lower surface of the aircraft, then took these verticals and put them on the wing tips, you would have the next generation aircraft known as the M151 TAV, and that's what we're going to consider next here. This is the actual aircraft right here. It's been given the gentleman's nod by Ben Rich, who took over the reins of the Skunk Works back in 1975. You can see here the two retractable canards for low speed operations. Over here we see the pilot, the co-pilot, and the launch control officer. He's the one who is in direct communication with the parasitic aircraft that is launched from the upper surface of the aircraft approximately 279 feet in length. It stands 10 feet off the ground on, on the wheels. The box-like air intakes drop down 7 feet from the lower surface of the aircraft, and <clears throat> the air intakes are large enough to put a Volkswagen Beetle directly inside. It uses two modified combined cycle turbo ramjet engines that burn a liquid methane fuel with liquid oxygen. The parasitic aircraft uses two scramjet engines, that's supersonic combustion ramjet, and there is a small liquid rocket designed and built by Rocketdyne to get two small 1,000 pound payloads into a low earth orbit. And so that's the breakdown on the M151 TAV. A good shot showing the parasitic aircraft being launched from the pylon of the mothership here. This is a good illustration done by my good friend Mark McCandlish, who I definitely think is the world's foremost military aerospace conceptual artist. I don't think there's anybody uh, better than Mark in vetting some of these aircraft out. Here you see what this thing actually looked like for low speed, the retractable canard, and then again we have the pilot, co-pilot, and launch control officer. Now, two different versions. One was built by North American Aviation, which was Rockwell, in coordination with Boeing. Lockheed had their version. Here we see the pylon for the launch of the parasitic aircraft, the jet fuel tanks with the JPA fuel. 
Also, the retractable canards, and this was 120 foot length for the wingspan and 220 foot overall length of the aircraft. Second version of the TAV, which was termed Reagan's Oriental Express, this is the aircraft that we were all supposed to fly in the late 1980s, was capable of doing a three earth orbit range, 100 mile altitude capability, 100 passenger capability, was designed to fly from LAX to Melbourne, Australia in 55 minutes. And so that's the time frame that you would be flying. A very quick trip. Uh, it also had the capability to do a missed approach. So by the time the fuel was burned off, it weighed many thousands of pounds less. And two strap-on jet engine pods were detachable, allowing this to do an actual missed approach. Now, during takeoff, it wasn't using conventional landing gear. It used something called ZEL, or zero launch length. This is designed to be launched with a strap-on solid rocket booster, almost like what we see on the conventional space shuttle today. Here you see the hydraulic lifting arms in this location. So that's the configuration and how this aircraft was designed to be launched. Lockheed Project ICE specifically mentioned and highlighted a zero tail configuration this is the wind tunnel test model, and I'm showing this because when you talk about milling time and machining time to put something like this together, there's thousands of dollars involved in machining these type designs. This is not a cheap thing to do here. So at the very least, we may have something that looks like this currently flying in the inventory right now. Now, Ben Rich is someone very important to keep in mind. He was the former head of Lockheed Skunk Works in Burbank, which actually moved to Palmdale later on. He took over the Skunk Works from Kelly Johnson back in 1975. I'm convinced that Ben was a team player. It seemed to me that he wanted to release some of this information into the public domain. Here is a quick quote from him. It says, we stand at the threshold of an opportunity to create an exciting new airplane an opportunity to use the technology honed over several decades to develop an aircraft for commercial use that can fly at speeds of Mach 6 and possibly higher. It makes sense, it is feasible, and clearly there is a need for it. So here we have Ben Rich own comments talking about a Mach 5, a Mach 6 aircraft, that we already have the technology to do this. Aviation Week, Space Technology, last year wrote a very interesting article on a two-stage to orbit space, space plane system called the Black Star. This was Boeing's version of the transatmospheric vehicle. You can see here that the parasitic aircraft is being launched from the belly of the ship rather than the upward section that we see on Lockheed's version. Lockheed Martin Black Star emblem, this is the patch that the pilots wear on their flight suits when they're involved in a number of these different programs. And then, of course, the C-5s that actually transport this aircraft, they have their own patch. And I'm going to leave this acronym up to the audience to decode as we move along here. <clears throat> now, we have the large mothership in this location right here, and then the XOV, or Experimental Orbital Vehicle, that was seen at Holloman Air Force Base landing. So we do have a good report from Aviation Week on that. Now their description was 200 feet in length, 120 feet wingspan. The smaller aircraft here was 90 feet. That's consistent with the Lockheed sightings also. Boeing's version being launched from the belly of the ship. Very good illustration. And you'll notice that there's a significant pattern recognition between this aircraft and the North American vintage XB-70 that crashed at Barstow in the mid-1960s. Here we have Chris Gibson's original 1989 report that started this quote-unquote Aurora craze. There was a KC-135 boom operation taking place over a offshore oil drilling platform in 1989. Two F-111s were flying chase, but it was refueling a completely Delta 75 degree swept wing triangle configuration. And that's where this really got started. He also had reports from people who saw this particular aircraft in a hangar not too far from RAF Boscombe Down during the same time frame. A 1983 photograph of Ronald Reagan and Kelly Johnson receiving the National Security Medal. 
and certainly want to give credit to Kelly Johnson to help win the Cold War with the construction of the F-104, the U-2, and the SR-71. He was also retained as a consultant on the F-117 program. Ben Rich again, starting with Project Harvey in 1977. That was the stealth program under the Carter administration. And we're going to examine just a few of his comments right here. Significant comments made by Ben Rich specifically pertaining to advanced propulsion and space travel. Here Ben states in a 1993 Wright-Patterson Air Force Base slide presentation, we did the F-104, the C-130, the U-2, the SR-71, the F-117, and many other programs that I cannot talk about. We are still working very hard. I just can't tell you what we're doing, directly from Ben Rich. Here he says, we already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black programs and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity, similar to what the Northrop engineers were talking about. Here he says at a UCLA speech, it is time to end all secrecy on this as it no longer poses a national security threat and make the technology available for use in the private sector. Over here, just before Mr. Rich passed away, he was scheduled to give a non-holds-barred interview to Jim Goodall. Unfortunately, that never happened, but Jim was able to reach Ben at the hospital. And Ben told Jim via phone conversation, he said, Jim, we have things out in the desert that are 50 years beyond what you could possibly comprehend. If you've seen it on Star Wars or Star Trek, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. We're talking about the head of Lockheed Skunk Works specifically focusing in on programs that are 50 years beyond what we could possibly imagine. Just incredible technology. Here we, we have some new things. We are not stagnating. What we are doing is updating ourselves without advertising. There are some new programs and there are certain things, some of them 20 to 30 years old, that are still breakthroughs and appropriate to keep quiet about. Other people don't have them yet. So again, you can see this interesting pattern recognition. The first known illustration of the stealth fighter <laughs> before it was declassified and released to the public on November 10th, 1988, was a really interesting design termed the F-19 stealth fighter. This is interesting because there was a discrepancy between the Northrop F-18 Hornet and the F-20 Tiger Shark, there was a missing gap there, so there was an F-19 that was allegedly supposed to go in there, McDonnell Douglas F-18. Here is what the F-19 looked like from the Testers Model Corporation. John Andrews was the senior project design engineer of Special Projects Rockford. He lived in San Diego at the time, and he certainly had some really interesting correspondence with Ben Rich. Now, when the F-117 eventually was declassified, allegedly that ended the discrepancy about the F-19. Everybody thought, this must be the F-19, but ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to say that there was something called the F-19, and I want to illustrate to you just the lineage of how we got to where we are now regarding the F-117. The DARPA project, Harvey, was started in 77 under the Carter administration. It's important to note that the most stealthy configuration that Ben Rich could come up with was a completely circular flying saucer configuration. There was definitely some stability problems with that, so they went to the next most stealthy configuration, which turns out to be a diamond. A, basically a cut diamond that they call the hopeless diamond. That moved on to the intermediate configuration where we have two Kennedy stabilizers with the crew compartment here, and then that led on to the near half blue configuration which moved to the F-117. Now here we have an actual very well done illustration of the F-19. This is a 1986 Learjet pilot report. This particular Learjet pilot was flying at about 10,000 feet altitude. He just broke out of a series of clouds, and uh, he noticed to his lower left-hand position, and just in front of him, a very unusual designed aircraft that looked like a flattened football diamond-shaped craft 
very dark, almost completely black. There were control surfaces along the leading and trailing edge of the aircraft. It had a very unique dorsal and ventral tail fin arrangement, almost like the B-17, but with a mirror image tail on the lower section of the aircraft. There was a NACA air intake on both sides of the pilot's compartment that terminated in a trapezoidal exhaust port on the trailing edge of the aircraft. There was an X-15 splitter canopy up front. Now, it dawned on this pilot that he could have ran into this aircraft in the clouds. And so he called ATC, which was Nellis Air Force Base at the time, and asked them, why didn't you advise me of the traffic in my vicinity? So ATC came back on the radio and said, what traffic? We're not painting anything. And this pilot came back and said, well, the heck there is. And I'm looking at a black, flattened football, diamond-shaped aircraft with a tail on top, a tail on the bottom. In fact, I can see the pilot's helmet. He was just ahead. He could see this pilot's helmet. There was a pause on the radio. A deeper voice, a differ, different voice came on the radio and said, Pilot of such and such Learjet, you will land at Nellis Air Force Base, and when you land at Nellis Air Force Base, you will taxi to the end of the tarmac, and when you taxi to the end of the tarmac, do not depart your aircraft. We will meet you. And for the next 18 hours, he was deep briefed about an aircraft he never saw, but that was an actual pilot sighting of the F-19. Here is the original sketch layout configuration of what this aircraft actually looked like prior to going to paint. Now, we don't know if this was a one-off prototype design. We don't know if there was an armaments, but if it did have armaments, it might have been a rotary bomb bay similar to what's used on the B-1B that was resurrected under the Reagan administration. The A-12 here, which turned out to be the SR-71, and then the F-100 Sentinel in this location. Again, you'll see the same 75 degree swept wing configuration on that side also. Now, I'm showing this to just illustrate what the Air Force likes to do and how they like to joke around with the public. U.S. Air Force insignia, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Air Material Command, and if you look at this logo, you'll see a number of different stealth aircraft embedded in this logo. There's five B-2s here on the circumference. There's one F-117 that folds right in here, and then there's that same 75 degree triangular configuration embedded in here. So they're telling us right here in their own logo that there are not two, but three classified programs currently ongoing. Two of them have been declassified. The last one is still a classified aircraft. Skunk Works, the evidence stacks up to a near certainty that a revolutionary step has been made in aircraft design. That's exactly what Ben Rich talked about. Skunk Works migrates north to the desert. April 9, 1990, the Skunk Works becomes its own entity. This is the shot of Burbank facility. They moved on to Palmdale Air Force Plant 42. And if you go there, that's what you will see today. This is the exterior building of the Skunk Works. You're not going to see anything secret on the outside. You will see this southwestern bay door, which is absolutely gigantic. That's a little pickup to show you the scale and size of this particular hangar. It's a very big facility. And I have an interesting report from a General Electric engineer who has been retired for 30 years. But in 1989, he was part of a very interesting operation that took place at Air Force Plant 42 Palmdale where they were towing this B-52 in an underground tunnel which connected Air Force Plant 42 to Edwards Air Force Base approximately 35 nautical miles as a crow flies and there was a parasitic aircraft that was lying right onto the upper surface of the B-52 but what he told me is as they were going down this tunnel there were four separate shafts that were connected to the main shaft Two of these shafts ran north, and two of these shafts ran south. One of the shafts that ran north, he said, was twice as big as this original shaft, and you could put two B-52 side by side and still have six feet on either side of the wingtips. Just an incredible, incredible underground tunnel facility. Now, I've, I've termed this particular slide the keepers of the secrets. This is the leadership of Lockheed Skunk Works. Kelly Johnson was the founder. He was uh, superseded by Ben Rich, Dick Hemp, Norm Nelson, then Sherm Mullen. Frank Capuccio is now the current head of the Skunk Works. 
Of course, Kelly Johnson and Ben Rich and Norm Nelson are no longer with us, so if anyone knows the real inside story of classified aircraft programs and what's going on right now, this is the man to see right here, Frank Capuccio. Now, they originally had a hydrogen-powered aircraft called the Suntan, which was eventually scrapped. It was a paper airplane design, but you'll notice here that they have almost the same dorsal and ventral tail arrangement that was used on the F-19. So we do have a pattern recognition in that location. Tag board design was the D-21 drone launch from the top of the SR, also called the M-51. That was also airdrop from a pylon off of a B-52. This is the procurement of how the Havblue led to the F-117, some of their radar cross-section ranges in Hellendale, California, that I'll be showing you in a few minutes. Here is the Nighthawk, first operational low observable aircraft. Ben Rich, again, was the Advanced Development Projects Agency VP. Norm Nelson was the project manager on this particular program. Let's just put it this way. We have things flying in the Nevada desert that would make George Lucas drool. <laughs> Lockheed Skunk Works Rye Canyon logo, again, this insignia here. The F-121 Super Sentinel was used as a unfriendly interceptor being launched from Tehachapi, California, at a place called the Ant Hill, using a very interesting field propulsion system called the Magnetic Field Disruptor. Now what they're doing here is, they're taking liquid mercury, they're pressurizing it to 250,000 atmospheres, they're rotating it at 50,000 RPM. There is a resultant decrease in the localized magnetic field by up to 89%. That means that the multi-mode impulse rockets that you see here only have to propel 11% of the craft. Now the G-forces are also lowered by 89% too. Now there's been a lot of controversy surrounding this particular propulsion system. There's some good physics reports that talk about spinning vortices of liquid mercury and we also have the ancient Sanskrit texts from India talking about viminas and how these particular craft also used flowing rotating vortice fields so this technology dates back a lot older than we might actually think the 1980 December 29th report of the Cash Landrum incident that took place near Dayton, Ohio, Dayton, Texas actually. Uh, I consider this to be one of the most rock solid UFO cases in history. Betty Hill, Vicki Landrum and a small child were driving down a uh, paved road. They came to a stop and saw this particular craft which was about 90 feet in length. It looked like an inverted double ice, chrome, ice cream cone configuration. There was a, a broad section here on the circumference mid portion of the craft that had portholes. Obviously they weren't portholes. There was, to my knowledge, nobody inside. There was another purpose for that, but there was a strange section down here that started spewing sparks and flames and actually burnt the surrounding pavement of asphalt right where this thing was bobbing over the center of the road. Now when Betty Cash was going back to her car, she got burned on the handle of her car door, and she eventually died from the effects of radiation sickness that she got from this. But this was a, definitely a dead solid case. Now, I just asked the question, would an alien craft be spewing out sparks and smoke and flames, and then would 24 double rotor Chinook helicopters be following after this? It seems more likely that this was one of our early atomic-powered spacecraft that went in Ray, and they were chasing after it. Interesting, only known newspaper article about something that took place at Norton Air Force Base November the 12th, 1988. There was a Thunderbirds demonstration at this particular open house, but unfortunately, there was poor visibility at this particular air show. IFR conditions prevailed at the time, and so this particular Thunderbird illustration had to be cut short. But concurrently going on, as these Thunderbird pilots were flying, something took place inside this big hangar at Norton Air Force Base, and it's actually called the Big Hangar. These shots just show you how big this hangar actually is. Here you see the interior of it, and then one more that shows the interior. 
This was a covert dog and pony show to garner support and funding for classified black programs. We know that Senator Alan Cranston was present. We know that Congressman George E. Brown Jr. was present and a number of high-level government military officials. Now, what was inside this hangar? This particular aircraft was one of the aircraft inside this hangar. It was an unmanned aircraft, approximately 100 feet in length, 65 feet across. The whole thing was comprised of thermal resistant, ablasive heat resistant thermal tiles directly taken off of the space shuttle. It's the same heat resistant system used on the space shuttle. There were four turbojet engines embedded into the interior of the craft, which was unmanned. Each had an air intake in the front and an exhaust port at the back. There were control surfaces along the leading and trailing edge that had tricycle landing gear. Now the concept being that the turbojets would take this aircraft up to about Mach 3. Once that happens, the leading edge of this aircraft starts glowing red hot and they start inserting a modified liquid methane fuel with a boron based additive directly into the superheated shock wave via these fuel injector nozzles. As soon as that happens, it immediately combusts and compresses right here between the superheated shock wave and the tapered after body of this aircraft, pushing it across the sky at about 12,000 miles an hour. They also had 121 launch tubes, each containing a nuclear device that could be launched in one-tenth of a second, about a 110 megaton warhead. So that was one of the aircraft that was present. Here you see the popular mechanics illustration of the external burning. There's absolutely no moving parts whatsoever in this particular aircraft. So we have the Aviation Week report. We also have the Jane's Defense Weekly report talking about America's chase hypersonic flight. So when you have two independent confirmation sources talking about the same configuration, plus the aerospace engineers who saw it in the hangar, you can rest assured that this was a real bird. The other aircraft that was in this hangar was something called the Super Stall. This particular aircraft used a conventional tail arrangement. There was an F-16 heads-up display in the forward cockpit. It had a very unusual outrigger wheel design for the landing gear. It had two miniature turbofan engines that tapered back to a platypus ex exhaust port. But the most unusual feature was a very unusual Venetian blind wing arrangement that used inconel plates, thermal resistant inconel plates. It also had a 30 millimeter Gatling up front. It's the same gun that you see on the A-10 Warthog that takes off at Davis Mountain here almost every day. A very interesting defensive system here, just to give you a size of the scale of this gun. That was embedded in the nose of this aircraft. The pilot had the capability to change the angle of attack of these deflector plates from 0 to 45 degrees, causing vertical takeoff. So that's the breakdown on the super stall. Now I'm proposing that a modified version of this particular jet engine, which is the Williams International FJX-2, was used on the super stall and that this particular engine went black. One reason why is because this turbine blade is not separate blades. It's one entire piece of metal machine. It's just an incredible machining done. The dry weight empty weight of this engine is 78 pounds. That's all it is. It weighs 78 pounds. It puts out 780 pounds of thrust. You could take this engine and render every piston reciprocating engine obsolete overnight just with this aircraft alone. That was supposed to power a number of advanced general aviation transportation systems that we were supposed to be flying today, yet it's not happened yet. And I think we're all waiting for that to happen. Here is the actual NASA release with the FJX-2 in the right side. Eclipse 500 originally had this Williams International engine, but it never came true. They actually changed their engine. They're no longer using the Williams engine. Now, separated by a large curtain at this Norton Air Force Base exhibit were three of these particular craft. They measured 24, 60. The largest one was 130 feet in diameter. It used off-the-shelf components. Many of the components, including these CCD cameras, were taken di directly off the Vegas casinos. Now, along the circumference of the crew compartment, we see that there were six CCD cameras, 
one on top for a total of seven. They could all be slewed in conjunction and produce an artificial image on the inside of the pilot's visor, directly like the Apache helicopter. It uses four ACES-2 seat ejection systems taken directly off the F-4 Phantom. There was a central column down the center of the aircraft. The composite panels were partially removed, showing some of the interior components of the craft. And the aerospace engineer who I talked to said that this thing had fingerprints all over it. It looked like it had been around for decades, just decades. There was a 12-foot diameter Tesla coil in this location, and then there were a number of capacitor plates along the bottom of the craft here. Now, the question is, how did this thing operate? How did it fly? A very, very high voltage electrical charge was fed into this Tesla coil via two deep cycle marine batteries. Once that happens, there's a magnetic field that forms above this craft in the form of a toroid donut. And by way of this rheostat device right here, the pilot had the capability of overlaying the field lines directly onto these capacitor plates causing pitch, yaw, and roll. And you could vary the voltage of these capacitor plates. This goes back to what's called the B-field Brown effect, where Mr. T. Townsend Brown in the late 1920s, early 1930s started experimenting with charge capacitor plates and he found out that when you charge a capacitor plate to very high voltage positive on one side and negative on the other, there's a resultant movement in the direction of the positive charge and that's what's happening here. Here you see a articulated arm that may be used for off-planet recovery of satellites or something further further than that. Air Force officer from Gung Ho, February 1988. We are flight testing vehicles that defy description. To compare them conceptually to the SR-71 would be like comparing Leonardo da Vinci's parachute design to the space shuttle. Exactly what we're talking about with electrogravitic propulsion systems. A retired Air Force colonel said, we have things that are so far beyond the comprehension of the average American Aviation Authority as to be really alien to our way of thinking. Now, the U.S. Air Force MEPA program, that stands for Nuclear Energy for Propulsion of Aircraft, the program started in 1946, it ran to 1951. It was replaced by something called the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Program that went from 51 to 58. Now that procured a number of aircraft, including the NB-36, the Convair X-6, the Convair model NX-2, and something called the heat transfer reactor experiment. Here is the MB-36 in flight. It never flew with the reactor on, but it flew with the reactor on board. There was 10,000 pounds of lead shielding up here to protect the pilot. So 10,000 pounds of fuel that could not be used. Here is the Convair atomic powered bomber. It never went into production. And then this is a different version here of almost the same similar configuration. A good shot of the only known picture we have of a nuclear powered jet engine. It was designed in Rand. Soviets were the first to run this over their country, although they had nuclear material spewing out the back end. It wasn't allowed here in the United States. The same engineer who told me about the B-52 also mentioned that he worked on the NEPA program back in 1960 at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Hangar No. 4, Bay E, in 1960. He reported working on a 40-foot disc that looked very similar to this. It had very strange, four robust landing gear configuration. So I asked the question to him, why would you need these gigantic, robust landing gear struts? And I said, is it because uh, of provisions for fuel? And he said, nope, that's not the reason. And then I asked, was well, this thing carrying some interesting cargo? And he said, nope. And at that point, he was about ready to hang up the phone. And I remember they were working on atomic-powered aircraft at the time. So I asked them, was this the shielding for a nuclear reactor? He said, yes. So that was one of the NEPA programs that was actually being worked on. Good photograph of T. Townsend Brown. He is the father of electrogravitics, and I propose that each one of you today is familiar with this particular technology because if you trace the lineage and do a patent search on something called the, the device that uh, moves air without any moving parts, something that you'll see at a uh, 
at a high-tech store in the malls, it's the air breeze. The same technology is used by T. Townsend Brown. Here is his patent. That's 3,187,206. It's called the ionic breeze. He's charging this capacitor plate to positive and the opposite to negative. There was a resultant movement in the direction of the positive charge, and that's what this graphic illustrates here. So there's mo no moving parts within this propulsion system, but yet these disks are moving on their own by the B-field Brown effect. Hunt for Zero Point Energy by Nick Cook is a very good book that talks about how this technology is used and where the origins of some of these demonstrators actually come from. The only known illustration of a top secret aircraft that crashed in the East German border region during the first month of the Bush senior administration had a crew of two that set tandem. Now I'm proposing that this was a Lockheed design just for the fact that you can see the same faceted flat plate technology used on the F-117. It had four or uh, three balls. There were two up front, one in the aft section. And when this particular aircraft crashed that you'll see right here, there was a hull breach on the port side. And then near the aft section of the hull, there was a crack or bent at about a 15 degree angle. One of these balls popped out, it was later recovered by crew. It had the consistency of a pineapple or a seashell. And there was a interesting gold braid embedded into these balls. And when these gentlemen recovered one of these spheres and they put this box around it, this box actually popped up on its own. So it had some residual effects still going on. So that was the 1989 crash on the East German border. The G engines are coming. By far the most potent source of energy is gravity. Using it as power for future aircraft will attain the speed of light. That's what we're exactly talking about. G engines, atomic powered aircraft. July 1957 Mechanics Illustrated article spoke specifically about the fact that at least 14 United States universities and other research centers are hard at work cracking the gravity barrier Convair on the West Coast, Glen L. Martin Aircraft Company of Baltimore, Maryland, Bell Aircraft Company of Buffalo, New York, Sperry Gyroscope Company of Great Neck, New York, maintain teams of researchers and engineers prying into nature's most jealously guarded secret, which is gravity. So by 1957, according to Mechanics Illustrated, they were already working on how to harness gravity. Popular Science wrote an interesting article about the remote test site, also known as Area 51. They do have the largest dry lake bed runway in the world. You can land one space shuttle on either side and still have 5,000 feet in between. They also have two half-paved, half-dry lake beds, which are supporting runways at the remote test site. Now, you can definitely see some of these programs ongoing at something called the Northrop RCS range not too far from Tehachapi, California. This is the map on how to get to their range. What you'll see when you get here are these things, which are not, in fact, runways. These are radar cross-section ranges. Over here is the pylons, and over here are the parabolic dishes in the lower right, but the pylons where these test articles are placed on top are located downrange. McDonnell Douglas, which is now Boeing, they have their own radar cross-section range, and you can fly over these facilities on the weekends. Here's what their facility looks like. Very expensive, very large. It's very remote here. On the lower right hand, you see a building that moves on 12, 12 rubber wheels. They move on these tracks here that you can see in this location, right here. And it covers a test article over here and over here. So that's Boeing's radar cross-section range. Of course, Lockheed has theirs, that's at Hellendale, California. This is their parabolic dish, a very large facility, absolutely. This is the 170 degree hangar pin turn that you would make right in here. This is a 50 ton concrete door that is moved via hydraulic cylinders and pylons can come out of here. Mobile trucks can go to an underground facility in this door entrance right in this location. Now this is a photograph of a good friend of mine, retired naval combat veteran Jack D. Pickett, who was in the NCO Club newsletter at McDill Air Force Base about seven miles east-west 
or actually lower west portion of Tampa. And he was driving down the perimeter road at MacDill Air Force Base. And when he got to this location right here, he saw four of the most amazing aircraft that he had ever seen before. Absolutely amazing at the base scrapyard. They are measured 20, 40, 70. The largest one was 116 feet in diameter. They all had tricycle landing gear. There were air intakes on both sides of the pilot's compartment. The crew compartment swept back to a very high vertical stabilizer. Here is an illustration of the large one. He mentioned that the large craft, which had a crew of five to six, the tail on the large one was higher than the mall parking lot lights that you would see at your standard mall parking lot. So very high vertical tail. There was the Signia on the port side, the official Air Force star and bars, and then U.S. Air Force written on the starboard side of the aircraft. Control surfaces located around the circumference of the aircraft. And so Jack Pickett was very interested. He wanted to take pictures of these, was denied access to taking pictures because there's no photography permitted on the base. So he was allowed to go inside the general's private library. The general personally took him up there. And this particular general pulled open this file drawer and started laying out literally hundreds of officially stamped Air Force photographs of these aircraft in flight, in formation, on the tarmacs. Just an incredible amount of photographs. This is a sketch that he drew from memory with an F-80 shooting star flying chase with these things in flight. And so Jack Pickett put a 16-page article together, which included a number of these photographs in here. And this is an actual plastic model that is now done in production. So we're getting the word out on that front. Here you can see the two air intakes on both sides of the pilot's compartment. And just prior to going to press with this story, there was an overflight of downtown Miami of a much more advanced DTOL vertical takeoff and landing version of this particular aircraft that took off from Avon Park. For some reason, they suffered a propulsion system malfunction. This thing dropped down to treetop level directly over downtown Miami, and the next morning, it was completely all over the network news. There was newspaper accounts. There was a media blitz all about this particular sighting. And so Jack Pickett, on his way into the general's office at MacDill Air Force Base, and this is a good computer-generated forensic composite illustration that shows you what these aircraft look like being towed on the dry lake bed. Here is the 40-foot disc here and then the 116-foot disc right here. This was an actual U.S. Air Force jet flying wing disc program. They did have some stability problems. They scrapped every remaining version of this aircraft with the exception of the four that were at MacDill Air Force Base. So when Jack Pickett brought this Tampa Tribune morning paper into the general's office, he said, General, I think we've got a problem here because on one side, you're getting ready to declassify these aircraft that are at the base scrapyard, and then on the other side, you're denying the existence of this thing that flew over downtown Miami. What do you guys want to do about this? So the general excused himself. He contacted Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska, he contacted the Secretary of the Air Force, the Secretary of Defense, and it came down from the highest echelons of the government to delay publication. That's where this story died in 1967. Now, if we only had Jack Pickett's account, there wouldn't be much of a story here because that's just one eyewitness report. And here is a good shot of it flying over Edwards Air Force Base. I was successful enough to track down an individual. Here's the shot of the four exhaust ports. And incidentally, it had a bomb bay in the lower section of the craft. Successful enough to track down this gentleman right here. His name is Warren Botts. He's a retired Air Force pilot, has over 30,000 hours as an Air Force pilot, flying everything from the P-40 all the way up to the F-104. I found him to be a very credible individual. A hero, an American hero, absolutely. He was at a Air Force reunion of the Flying Tigers back in 1966. And as they were going through the hangars, the Air Force Museum is over here. Here is hangar number four, Bay E. It has five bays. That's A, B, C, D, and E. Roosevelt's DC-6 was right in here. And via a connecting doorway, 
Warren Botts walked into this last hangar, which is hangar E of building number four here, and parked nose first into the hangar was the exact same aircraft that Jack Pickett had saw at the base scrapyard at McDill one year later in 1967. So we had independent confirmation from a reliable secondary source that in point of fact there was a U.S. Air Force jet flying wing disc program. There absolutely was such a program. So I'm convinced that a number of these programs can be declassified and they can re represent any no threat to the national security whatsoever. The propulsion systems that are involved with these programs can definitely help to repair the environment. They can improve the lives of everyone here in the United States and improve the lives of everyone around the world. And I want to thank you for your attention. How did you begin to stumble upon and uh, learn of these black projects, these Air Force black projects? I mean, everybody knows about black budgets, but what propelled you into that, the sophisticated study and analysis that you've made of it? I've had an interest in exotic aircraft my entire life. There was a 1994 popular science article that talked about secret air base and that was directly related to the remote test site in Nevada, also known as Area 51. They had some illustrations in there that were very inspiring, and that's what led me to my further research on black aircraft programs. And since that time, I've been basically full-time tracking down these things, and that's been the thrust of my research. Were there any other individuals that influenced your vision of, of what was going on, and how did they play a role in formulating your your overall world view of what's happening here. Uh, Mark McCandlish is something, someone that I think should be mentioned here. He is a absolutely incredible forensic composite aerospace illustrator. He has worked for Lockheed, Northrop Boeing, General Dynamics, Northrop major aerospace corporations, has held a top secret security clearance. And whenever one of these aerospace prime corporations needed a new illustration for a new proposal, they would come to Mark to do the illustration. And so that's how Mark got these first-hand accounts of these exotic aircraft. I was able to, to uh, develop a friendship with Mark, and from that point forward, we've been trading information and illustrations from that point. Now, in, in uh, investigating these, have you ever made direct contact with any of these aerospace uh, corporations through the public information offices in those particular corporations? Mm -hmm. And have they ever responded back to you? I have never gone through any kind of public information officer because I think they're not going to say anything anyway. I really maintain a more direct approach by sending a briefing document first or a phone call and then follow up with a personal interview. I find that's a better approach. And has that worked on a number of occasions? It has, uh, it has worked, yes. Uh, for a former Lockheed Skunk Works engineers have opened up to me and given me firsthand conceptual sketches that have never been seen before. Now, you began to take a series of UFO photographs. Tell me how these uh, photographs of these UFOs are related to the Nazi program in the first place. The photographs that I took were small models that I built myself just to try out the different types of angles, focal lengths, and viewing projections, and how that relates to other type case files. That's the reason why I created those. Okay, so the, the, the photos that are in Wendell's uh, book, Nazi Flying Discs, are any of those of the genuine article, uh, a UFO or a government created air, aerospace aircraft, or are those all models that you have photographed? They are based off of the drawings from the original German designs. None of them are computer generated illustrations whatsoever. They're all models. So you've placed models in the air, filmed them, and uh, that those are the flying those are models of flying discs. That is correct. Okay, so they are not actual operating aircraft. They are only models. That is correct. Okay, so you were never on any uh, sites while test uh, aerospace tests were being made and filming any uh, unidentified flying aircraft. Well, I have been to Area 51 three times, and I was successful in recording video footage of anomalous craft. I cannot prove they were alien, man-made, or either, but uh, I was at that site at that time. But the aircraft in Wendell's book 
our models that I've built. Okay. Now let's go back. clarify that. Are you making it clear to the public that those pictures are of models and actually not of unidentified? I hope that I've tried to make that clear. In my presentation today, I've specifically stated that a number of the illustrations that were shown were computer-generated forensic composite illustrations. That's similar to this illustration right here. This is the quote-unquote alien reproduction vehicle that was at Norton Air Force Base November the 12th, 1988. There were three of them there measuring 24 feet in diameter up to 130 feet in diameter and this is based off aerospace engineering testimony and eyewitness accounts. Okay, now let's run through those photos that you have there and, and maybe give us a little bit of a background on, on each of them. Well this craft was operational 1960, that's nine years before Apollo 11. This may explain why Neil Armstrong will not talk about Apollo 11 because there's a high likelihood that he was not the first person on the moon according to the aerospace literature that we have regarding this particular program. So that's this one. This is an illustration of the U.S. Air Force Jet Flying Wing Disc Program, vintage 1946. There were four of these at MacDill Air Force Base, September 1967. They all had tricycle landing gear. There were control surfaces along the circumference of the disc. Unfortunately, this particular program suffered from stability problems and it was the Air Force to decision to scrap all remaining in this family with the exception of the four that were at, at MacDill Air Force Base. But this was an actual flying U.S. Air Force jet disc program. TR-3A Black Manta, it's known as the Manta Ray. It's a joint General Dynamics McDonnell Douglas program used as a digital real-time reconnaissance intelligence gathering aircraft during Desert Storm had a crew of one, it was a carrier based operation, could also take land operations. Two air intakes on both sides of the pilot's compartment and a canted vertical stabilizer that's canted inward, so that was the Black Manta. A craft that was seen by over 25,000 eyewitnesses in the Hudson Valley area between 1982 and 1988 all reported a completely silent boomerang manta ray shaped craft that was capable of hovering, very slow flight, uh, a definitely a solid UFO case. That's the Hudson Valley. Do you have any actual photographs as opposed to computer generated images? I do of not this? have any photographs, but they. Were saw, there some taken? Or there, there were, and on the Unsolved Mysteries segment, they have video footage of the actual lights Hudson themselves. Valley. Mm -hmm. Here is the cutaway on what we're seeing actually taking place along the B-2's leading edge by positively charging the leading edge of the wing, negatively charging the exhaust gases. There's a resultant drag coefficient reduction up to 60 percent in the radar cross section. And why is that important? That's important because we're allegedly told that the B-2 is a subsonic aircraft, but according to this report from Aviation Week Space Technology, they can reduce their drag coefficient by up to 60 percent, meaning that this could be supersonic. And, in, and actually have zero sonic footprint. So it would be very stealthy, very quiet. This is a good drawing of the B-2 that shows the triangle trailing edge and the double W. This is not what was reported in the Hudson Valley, so you can see how it was a completely different craft. Incidentally, it's $2.3 billion per aircraft on the B-2. The A-12 Avenger II was a vintage 1990s procurement for a high-altitude all-weather interceptor designed to replace the A6 intruder. By 1990 there was a design order for 650 of these aircraft, but by 1991 the entire program got cancelled at the cost of five billion dollars. Boeing Phantom Works Bird of Prey is the most recently declassified aircraft October 2002. 67 million dollars for the program. 47 feet in length, 23 foot wingspan. The first aircraft to use the single composite aircraft construction in conjunction with the throwaway tooling and the 3D virtual reality design. This is now at the Air Force Museum of Dayton, Ohio. And I definitely want to go on record as saying that there is a German slash Nazi component to the UFO phenomenon and I state that because of a book written by an author named Thomas Augustin who wrote a book called Blunder, How America Gave Away Nazi secret, Super Secrets to Russia. 
And in that book, it specifically talks about SS General Hans Kammler and how he disappeared off the radar screen, how five fake graves were made for him, and how he actually escaped. There's a possibility he did a deal with the American government, and that led directly to the SCOTA works and the programs that were going on at the SCOTA works, including laser weaponry, donar ray guns from the Tesla era, and also flying saucers that was definitely being used. SS General Hans Kammler was Walter Dornberger's boss who went to work for Bell Aircraft in New York. He was also Werner von Braun's boss, and he would be in a position to know more than anyone else in the Nazi party, the Nazis' most secret weapons development program. Uh, definitely what happened after World War II is a lot of these programs were shipped to Wright Field, were shipped to Fort Bliss, and also White Sands. The Red Army got an, a number of interesting designs because of a crazy, dumb mistake that the American Army did in giving away a number of Nazi secrets including blueprints, diagrams, patents, drawings. Accidentally, apparently, this happened and they got a jump on the space program which led to them being the first in most every space thing before we could ever do anything uh, in 1958, the forming of NASA. So that's just a real quick overview of what's going on here, and I definitely want to state that there's a German component to this. So in relation to the German component, what's, our, what's your earliest information about where they began their program? What years did that initiate? Was it 33, 34, 35? When did their program begin, and how was it financed, and how did it mature? There is some evidence to indicate that the German secret societies, the Tula, the Black Sun, the Vril Society, were involved in a number of these programs. And then moving on to uh, Blum and Voss Corporation and Heinkel Corporation, which were involved in a number of the U.S. Air Force jet disc programs later, vintage 1946. But we have some very good indication that it was vintage 1943, vintage 1942, when America was bombing the ball bearing factories and oil refineries, that was the point where a call was put out to aerospace manufacturers in Germany at the time for a VTOL vertical takeoff jet disc design that would do away with the need for runways. And so that's how the origin of this took place. Now, I understand that there were uh, maps that were found uh, by air technical intelligence. Colonel Stevens says one came across his desk with Saturn-like uh, images, profiles, where these different bases were. Have you ever run across this particular map or seen? I have heard of the map from Wendell. I think I've seen a few slides of it. Uh, there definitely does seem to indicate that there, there's good evidence to support that fact. We know that some of these programs were shipped to South America. There is some in evidence to indicate that it went to Antarctica with Operation High Jump with Admiral Byrd, who on his return trip said that we would have to face an enemy that could fly from pole to pole at tremendous speeds unrefueled. So that would appear to be some of the German craft. When uh, the Operation Paperclip was going, uh, first it was called Overcast and then developed into Paperclip. As the Americans were taking over Nazi bases and finding out that there were bases right underneath their positions uh, that they hadn't even known about, um, I understand that uh, there was, uh, the Russians were able to take up over a couple of the facilities in the Czechoslovakia region and, and the more Eastern European locations. What did the <coughs> excuse me? What did the Russians gather? Uh, according to your best information, that the United States and al uh, American allies and, and, and Western European allies did not recover, and how did that allow them to progress in, in deference to the, the U.S. program? Well, it's technically anybody's guess what the Russians recovered, but we know for a fact that they got the jump on the swept wing jet fighter interceptor concept in the form of the MiG-15. They were the first leaders of that. They obviously got some two stage to orbit type designs. Very interesting air cannons were procured under that, and then whatever else was going on at the Skunk Works is some of the things that they recovered. How did we get the Nazi program to the United States going, and what happened in New Mexico over the, the course of the, the 40s, and how did that influence 
the, the real takeoff of the aerospace program in the mid-50s? Well, definitely after those Nazi scientists went to NASA, went to the aerospace companies, including Bell, some of them were filtered on to Fort Bliss, White Sands, and Wright Field. From there, uh, it's possible that what crashed at Roswell was in point of fact not an alien device, but something buried deep within the SCOTA works that eventually went to the United States. So that's a breakdown of where and how some of those programs got there. And how do you account for, or do you not account for, any uh, reports of alien bodies? The, the Roswell mortician claiming he saw them, and a number of other people claiming they had seen bodies. How would that interrelate into a, a U.S. military program as opposed to being, uh, you know, fitting in with an extraterrestrial hypothesis? I think it's very important to never underestimate Air Force OSI. That's the Office of Special Investigations. They're the ones who head up the counterintelligence division for the Air Force, and these gentlemen personnel are absolute professionals. We should never underestimate their ability to lie, deny, and deceive. So what we think may have happened at Roswell may actually be something completely different. So it's important to keep that point in mind, definitely. Do you have an extraterrestrial hypothesis that works in conjunction with your aerospace investigations? Or do you, um, are you leaning more towards the, the theories and hypotheses that um, the, all these crafts that, that people have been seeing over you know, the, the last 60 years or so have been generally um, man-made? There are no first-hand eyewitness accounts of anyone living currently of the bodies at Roswell. Everyone has passed down. There are no first-hand eyewitnesses that saw the body, so we cannot interview them. However, to state that every unknown UFO that we see in the skies is a man-made craft is inconsistent with the knowledge and the case files that we have going back to the Chinese, going back to the Romans. We've got case files of naval French officers where craft are being shot right through the ice and particles and parts of the ice are going onto the bow of the ship, going into space and then breaking through the ice on the end of the parabola. This is years and decades, millennium before aircraft were invented here in this country. So, again, that's not consistent with man-made craft whatsoever. So what is your uh, view as far as the extraterrestrial hypothesis? I is there something going on? What's the relationship between the, the military and leadership of, of the you know, various governments uh, of the planet? And is there any connection between, do they have secret knowledge about extraterrestrials that they're withholding it from us, and what do you think that is? The so? military-industrial complex would like nothing more than an, a spaceship to land in Washington, D.C., and an alien to get out, because that would cover or hide their own deep black programs under the alien extraterrestrial theory. That's what they want people to believe. However, that does not discount the phenomenon in general because this has been going on for thousands of years and so again it's not consistent with everything being a man-made craft. How do we make that curve from uh, the Wright brothers to uh, you know landing on the moon in 60 years? Do you think that's a, a, an actual non-intervention uh, curve of knowledge being implemented by humanity, or do you think there's been some assist by extraterrestrials in that curve? German professor Oberth, who is regarded as the father of rocketry, stated that we had help from others regarding our space aerospace industry. Now, exactly what, what he meant by that is slightly open to interpretation, but it's clear he was talking about extraterrestrial civilizations helping us with our space program, that's certainly something that he was wanting to bring to the forefront. So what do you think the U.S. military is hiding in terms of extraterrestrials? They're hiding the technology associated with the propulsion system because anyone who has the monopoly on this kind of technology, they rule the world because when you control the skies and you control the high ground, you control the world, no one can touch you. So that's one reason why they want to keep it extremely black. Do you think there's uh, any suggestions or information out there that leads you to the, the conclusion that uh, the United States military and uh, certain NATO military are aligned with certain uh, ET confederations or alliances? 
there's been stories about an alliance during the Eisenhower administration going up through the Reagan administration, but I have no actual detailed documentation to prove that, so I cannot comment on that. What have you heard about people coming out of Skunk Works and various aerospace programs? Uh, I'm sure you've talked a little bit off camera, off record with some of these people. What are they telling you? I interviewed a gentleman who was the co-author of a book called Skunk Works with Ben Rich. He was present at an unveiling ceremony of the F-117 actually before it was rolled out to the public on November 10, 1988 and during a cafeteria group meeting where the pilots of the F-117s were eating lunch with this co-author and Ben Rich was present too. One of the pilots came over to the author and just told him as kind of a side comment that we have things flying that are beyond belief and that's consistent with comments made by former Lockheed Skunk Works project engineer Ben Rich who said that we have things flying that are 50 years beyond what you could possibly even dream of. What's your view of the STS-48 tape? What's going on in that particular? I believe that was a smart, brilliant pebble test program using a rail gun. And shooting at? Shooting at a alien piloted craft, or it might have been a test craft that we built, but they wanted to see if we could attain those velocities to shoot something down. Do we have bases on the moon or Mars? I can't prove that, but according to the ARV, which first flew in 1960, nine years before Apollo 11, we've already been there. Ben Rich said that we've already we've already had that technology, so we've already been there. If you can get to orbit, you can get halfway to anywhere in the universe. That's the whole key. All you got to do is get to orbit, because by that time, you don't need to get out of our Earth atmosphere anymore. We don't need to have to deal with the effects of gravity. So just getting into orbit is halfway to getting to anywhere. Now we've got some astronauts that have come out public too and actually said uh, Edgar Mitchell and others have come out and said hey you know we've seen them up there there are ET craft up there what information do you have and what's your view about of, of the astronauts who've come out and made statements to that effect there was a shuttle program during the 90s that had a umbilical cable cord it was an antenna that was on a large cable approximately 16 miles long there was a malfunction and that cable snapped and we knew the length of the cable and as soon as that happened a tremendous amount of very strange circular objects with a notch cut out of them started surrounding that cable and we can gauge the diameter of those craft because they were approximately one twelfth the size of that cable indicating that they were between one and two miles in diameter and they were going behind the cable so they were just absolutely gigantic craft, so that's some indication that there was other out there at that time. What is your view on the Philip Corso material, and do you think he, his uh, book, Day After Roswell, is uh, factual, or do you suggest that uh, their, uh, his report there is not credible? I just don't think there's enough information there and documentation to prove all of Corso's claims. It's certainly possible that that technology, including the transistor, the integrated circuit, the night vision, the fiber optics, were handed down to aerospace industries and Bell Laboratories, but I just don't think there's enough evidence to tie all the dots together. What would you need to convince you? Some of the hardware. Some of the actual hardware would be very convincing. How do you account for the rapid development of fiber optics in the short period that it was claimed to have been developed? Well, this was allegedly one of the technologies that was found inside the hull of the Roswell craft. However, when we're spending between one and two hundred billion dollars on classified programs, the government is going to get something for their money. So I never underestimate what the government puts into these programs. What about the Bob? What's your feel? You've been to Area 51. Do you, yes. What are you feeling about Bob Lazar and his testimony? Jim Goodall was a good friend of Bob Lazar, still is, and he believes that uh, Bob Lazar is a legitimate person and his story is legit. I met Bob Lazar once about 10 years ago for 15 minutes. We didn't get time to talk much, so I, I just don't know if his story is true. Uh, he does raise some very interesting points. Stanton Friedman completely discards him whatsoever, but again, 
in favor of Bob Lazar, he did know where and when the test flights were to take place. So I went out there and tested his theory, went out there on a Wednesday night, and I was successful in capturing something. So Bob Lazar definitely knows something, and that's the extent of, of my uh, understanding of Mr. Bob Lazar. Well, according to Bob Dean, and his assessment report, mm -hmm. some of those people look just like us, so it's possible they're not from around here. But what I will say is, on this particular aircraft, which is the quote-unquote alien reproduction, the general who was giving the lecture on this stated that they could achieve light speed or better with this craft. So if that's true, and we know how possibly space-time works and what Bob Lazar talked about by bringing your destination toward you by creating an artificial gravitational field. We've already been to the stars. This is very consistent with what Ben Rich talked about. And we know that George Bush has no clue and has no need to know about that type of program. So definitely, I'm definitely a believer that there is a exopolitical group that's controlling this that's outside any congressional oversight whatsoever. Let's go back and talk about uh, the Area 51 visits. How did that originate? How did you, what did you go to the site with? What cameras and equipment were you taking? And what uh, photographic evidence did you procure? Well, this just happened vintage 1995 when there was a lot of public awareness about Area 51. And this was just prior to Freedom Ridge being grabbed by the Bureau of Land Management at that area in the county there. And you could still get relatively close to Area 51. We were about 19 nautical miles away from the actual base. But on a Wednesday night, I and three other people in a small minivan, after 10 o'clock, were successful in recording at least three anomalous craft that did not blow in the direction of the prevailing wind. They held their position. They hovered. Don't know what they were, but we did get them on tape. Where are the current test facilities, the first line facilities for testing this? Are they in the United States? Are they out of the United States? Well, where are they doing the, where's the United States doing most of their most advanced testing? Of course, there are bases overseas at RAF Boscombe Down. Obviously, everyone knows about the remote test site in Nevada. The area just south of Area 51 known as S4, where is allegedly where Bob Lazar saw his nine craft in the hangars. We also have a facility in Utah that's very hot. And then one place that most people constantly forget about is Edwards North Base. Not Edwards Air Force Base, but Edwards North Base. That's a very deep black program uh, procurement area. They have underground facilities there, and very little has ever been written about Edwards North Base. We also know that there was, in the late 80s, during the Reagan-Bush administration of that period, there was work on a super collider going through the southwest of the United States, underground super collider testing. Um, and uh, you talked about earlier in your lecture here uh, at MUFON in Tucson um, about a uh, underground uh, tunnels and hangars, but uh, specifically tunnels that were quite wide enough to hold uh, two uh, large aircraft uh, side by side and still have space on either end. So where are these tunnels going? Are they going short distances to remote facilities? Or are they going long distances traversing states uh, and regions in the United States? Well, the engineer that I spoke to never gave any specific details regarding where those other shafts went. But if you extrapolate the data and keep in mind that we've been basically boring 40-foot diameter holes in the ground using nuclear powered tunnel boring machines for the past four decades by now it's very easy to calculate that they have crisscrossed the united states and have connected these up definitely i'm a believer that we have a shuttle system and this is already a done deal it's in the works now the rand corporation is the one who procured the funding for the tunnel boring machines so you said uh, the control of this technology, control of the airspace, would lead to world domination in effect. Absolutely. Where do you think they're taking all this? Uh, that You say they've got technology that's 50 years ahead of anything we could even imagine. Right. Well, if we can imagine Star Wars and imagine Star Trek, and you're saying they have technology 50 years ahead of that, yes. that really is that's beyond belief. Exactly. Really, beyond no, the scope, scope of normal belief based on the evidence that's been provided to us. So how can you make that assertion? The only way that I can think that we have a reason for these programs 
It ultimately goes back to General MacArthur at West Point Naval Institute where he gave his farewell address to naval candidates there where he said that during our next great war we would have to face an enemy that would be outside of our solar system and we should prepare now for such an invasion. So if what he says and what he knew at that time is true, that's consistent with what Ronald Reagan said during the Reagan administration three times, including one time in the United States, where he made reference to the fact that the USA and Russia should join forces to repel such a threat and how we would forget our petty differences and unite as one. So that's something to consider. Maybe they know something that is coming this way and we've been developing these programs, chemical lasers, space-based weapon system as a defensive system, not against the Soviet Union, but by an external threat referenced by General MacArthur. Do you think perhaps there's been an internal invasion as opposed to a physical uh, invasion? An internal in invasion at the White House? Uh, no, a a into military levels where there's already been uh, an invasion of an ET confederation aligning itself, giving technology to, say, the Western world, where this extraterrestrial confederation has actually empowered and traded technology for the rights to, um, you know, sample human beings, and has... Is there any evidence in what you've uncovered suggestive of the fact that uh, there is an ongoing alliance and communication between groups of ETs and elements within the U.S. military and military industrial complex? I have no way to document that case. I don't know if there's any way to prove that particular alliance. What's the best evidence you have to suggest to you that there is cooperation between extraterrestrials and uh, the military-industrial complex? Only from comments made by Ben Rich, where he talked about how a number of our man-made UFOs were unfunded opportunities. Those are his own words, unfunded opportunities. That may mean that, according to Ben Rich, we have received hand-me-downs from other groups outside the solar system we have reverse engineered those programs and that's what he was referring to. Now, earlier Jim asked a question about Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar was saying that, you know, his testimony was basically yes, that that's all we've been doing back over in Area 51 and S4 is back engineering uh, what we've already been given or what we've already captured. So, um, why should we disbelieve Bob Lazar? Is there any reason to disbelieve any of his well, story, regardless of what Stanton Friedman says? When we've checked on his background, no one has any record of him being at Los Alamos. The only thing we have is a phone book where his name is actually mentioned there. That's not much to go on, but uh, the background checks just did not work out. But ultimately, I think Bob Lazar is certainly onto something here. Just can't prove that he was at S4. If he was, he was only there for a few days. He was a temporary contractor. He was not a full-time person. He was only there very on a temporary basis. It wasn't anything that was consistent whatsoever. How would we get any of these people? What do they stand to lose by coming out? And how are we going to get people deep within Skunk Works and, pe and places like this where these operations are going on to, to have the courage to come out and maybe, you know, definitely give us evidence of a extraterrestrial U.S. military industrial complex connection. There's a mandate that these people follow who are involved in these programs and it goes like this, those who know do not speak and those who speak do not know. So that's the mandate that they follow. They're not going to tell the general public, they're not going to tell the congressmen, senators, the president, it is an unacknowledged special access program, and if you're not cleared for that particular program, a Project Q, which is the clearance level that you're allowed to for the nuclear launch code, if you're not cleared for that, you're not going to know the program. So these people, they're generally not going to talk about the program. Okay, in a sociological aspect, are these people aligning themselves against the bulk of humanity and saying we have the right to control your lives and your destiny because we control the airspace and the most sophisticated military technology so therefore we're kings of the planet? The evidence is pointing in that direction. Just take a look around you. They're controlling the media, they control the utilities, they control what we read, what we see. It's already been controlled so that's already a done equation. It's being, it's taking place right now. So what's the final evolution of, of that plan? Where do you see that headed? 
that's anybody's guess. But it doesn't look good for the common man on the street. I mean, why would they be doing this? It, it doesn't look like it's going to be a user-friendly ending. It has more of a sinister approach. And so I'm hoping that there's still time that we can possibly turn this around. But it's going to take a massive revolution and a massive conscious awakening in the American public and around the world that these people need to be removed from office and we need to take back what our founding forefathers had originally stated and that's the last hope we have. And could we have gone from the Wright brothers in 1903 to that uh, ability in uh, the mid 80s or early 90s without help in your opinion? Good question. Don't know. Just don't know the answer. What's I mean, your opinion? It looks like we've been helped. It just it looks like we've been helped. I can't prove that, but from what Ben Rich said, Professor Oberth said, some of the comments made by Von Braun, who talked about an alien threat and how it wasn't an alien threat, but that we did have help too, it just it appears to be heading in that direction. And your feeling is it's a sinister ending for the common man. I just why would they be building chemical lasers and brilliant pebbles and ceramic tiles that can be launched in 13 kilometers per second for what? What purpose? To fight terrorism, to fight someone in the desert? There's got to be a bigger reason for it. And most of those space-based weapons are pointed not toward Earth, they're pointed outside our solar system as though they're defending our world from an impending threat from outside our solar system. So Again, that raises the question, why do we have this? That's the biggest threat that we have in this world right now. It has nothing to do with aliens, but it's the arrogant people inside NORAD, inside the defense contractor industry who think that they can play games with these visitors and try to shoot them down and exploit the technology. That's the way you start world conflicts, and that represents the biggest threat we have in this world at this time. Is there any other final thoughts uh, that you'd like to add uh, that, you know, maybe the, the viewer should, who wants to be active with the material that you've provided and uh, get it out to others in the public should do? And, and what specific points are the most important points for us to understand in terms of your research? I just think that people should take a very objective view of the UFO phenomenon and not believe right off the bat that what we're seeing our ET craft because the government has lied to us previously and past times. For instance, the F-117, the Havlu f prototype first flew 1977, wasn't released to the public until 1988. So that program had been operational for over a decade before it was ever acknowledged. So when you go out at night and you see something very strange, there's a high likelihood that it could be one of ours, and I certainly want to keep that in mind. Michael, thank yep. you.